Another common one, which just has the larger stocks in Canada is the TSX 60. So RBC has a fund that's a balanced fund. And, and what I've done here is I've just compared uh, about a 10 year period uh, between, between the two. And you can see that the fund slightly underperformed uh, the TSX 60. And if you bought a, a, a TFSA that just tracked the TSX 60, you'll be better off. By the way, many economic studies have shown that in the long run, you don't beat the market. And the reason is, is you're picking from the market and there's this concept in math called regression to the mean. So on average, things regress to average. And so it's not unusual for a fund to do very well and then do very badly. One thing you will notice with the balanced fund is it doesn't have a, as high a standard deviation. So in this particular fund, what you're doing is you're giving up a little bit of growth in favor of a little bit of stability. But if you look at this, you can, you know, you can see that the TSX went way up and then shot way down and then bounced back. So you can see they follow similar patterns See right here, you can, right, you can see that they fall. So, but the TSX went way up, and then when it dropped, it went way down. That was your um, your your 2008 crash, and then shot way up. Look at that nice gentle growth. So if if you're the kind of investor that really doesn't like um, a lot of volatility, that would have been a better option for you. So in this example, the MER was 2.36 of which 1.85% was the management fee. This is a no load fund. So that doesn't mean there's, it means there's no front end load and there's no rear end load for that fund. By the way, that's very common with the mutual funds sold by the chartered banks. Because remember all of the chartered banks have um, brokerage arms and uh, investment arms. Uh, and in fact, the Canadian chartered banks, when they announced their recent quarterly results, did extremely well. And people thought, well, why'd you do so well during COVID? Well, it's because the markets have been go have come up very, very, been very, very strong. In fact, I just listened to something, and this is out of the United States, but from the bottom of the trough after COVID first came out to one year later, it's the single biggest one year growth in the history of the S&P 500 in the United States. And it's fairly similar. Canada hasn't grown quite as much, but it's done very well. Thank you very much. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, uh, but excess liquidity in the market due to central banks and extraordinarily low interest rates have forced money out of bonds and saving type investments into more risky capital investments pushing money into the stock market, which drives up the value of those stocks. And um, uh, as long as they continue to print money, uh, it's a good bet that they will continue to do that um, in the economy. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I, in fact, as much as I, I got my commerce degree, truth of the matter is, is, is I actually, my, my first love academically is math and economics, not the commerce part. I really enjoy um, economics. Now, an exchange traded fund is similar to a mutual fund, but it's a little bit more of a formula. So um, let me give you a really simple example. Uh, there are a couple of funds just based on Canadian chartered banks. All they own are Canadian chartered banks. So they would own the big five. Sometimes they'll own so that when I say big five, I should clarify that. I've been accused of using uh, words that I know that intelligent, normal people don't use. So that's the Royal Bank of Canada or RBC. I'm trying to get it in order. I may get the order wrong. RBC, TD, I think BMO, Scotia, CIBC. Now they're the big five, but I may have BMO and Scotia in the wrong order. Okay. Those are the big five chartered banks. In addition to those five chartered banks, there is um, Laurentian Bank, which is primarily out of Quebec, um, Canada Western Bank, which is out of Calgary, 
and National Bank, which is fairly new. And they are full-blown chartered banks, but, but some of those funds include the big five. Some add the sixth, which I believe is Laurentian. I believe Laurentian is slightly larger. So that's just one example of an exchange-traded fund. And so what they would do is they balance it. So if, for example, Royal Bank goes up more, every quarter they'd sell some of the Royal Bank and maybe buy some CIBC because it's a little bit lower. So they balance. Then the next quarter, maybe TD's up and everybody else is about the same. So they'll sell a little bit of their TD and they'll buy everything. But they've got a, a, they, a percentage formula. And every quarter they rebalance it. And every quarter they take the dividends and they either pay them out or they would retain those, or you can use those dividends to buy more dividends or to buy, to buy more shares in that exchange traded fund. Okay. I've got some exchange traded funds. I really like exchange traded funds. If I was telling a young person today who wanted to build their wealth, I would tell them to put their money into balanced ETFs in both Canada and the United States and don't do anything. In the long run, the markets tend to go up. And in the long run, you don't beat the average because in the long run, the average is the average. People, by the way, that really beat the average are people that are um, usually in the small cap space. And those have got high volatility. That would be your TSX venture exchange, for example. So it's similar to a mutual fund. There, some actually now are actively managed. So they, they're more like a mutual, but it's not as active as a mutual fund is supposed to be. But the big beauty of the exchange traded fund, the ETF, is the fact that the fees are way lower. The lowest one, and they just lowered it again, but um, there's one from a company in the United States who, who kind of pioneered this work called Vanguard. And uh, if those of you who are interested, it's VOO. And VOO has an, a, a fee of, I think it's like, I think they just dropped it to below 0.3 of a percent. And all it is, is a basket of all the funds in the um, S&P 500. So if something drops out of the S&P 500, they'd sell it and buy whatever came in. And if some stocks go up more, every once in a while, they balance it. I think it's every quarter. They balance that thing. But you're effectively betting on the entire U.S. economy or the U.S. stock market when you do that. You can do the same with the NASDAQ, which tends to be a bit more tech heavy. And so the tech heavy NASDAQ went up very quickly. Um, I own one called QQQ. And it is not just a tech stock. It's the top tech stocks. It's got your Microsofts, your Alphabets, um, uh, Microsoft, Alphabet, Apple, uh, um, and they've got some NVIDIA in there. I don't remember if they have Facebook or not. But what, if you think one sector will do well, or you're interested in that sector, um, it, it, can, it can be something that you're interested in. Here's um, the, the, uh, the S&P against the um, uh, BMO cap composite indexes. So this is, this is a fund. And so what you can see is this would be um, the market. And in fact, in this example, the fund actually outperformed market. But what I want you to see is look at how they, they're, they're so identical. They just follow each other, just like a spider on a mirror doing pushups. You're betting the market. You're not picking stocks. You're picking the market. By the way, the reason that this would have gone up is if they reinvested the dividends, you'd be getting the bump from those dividends. Now, some funds, and they're called income funds because they, get this, give you income. That's one of my pillars, remember? So for example, you can put money into a fund, and this is this is a pretty good little fund. If you if you you see, I can't see you, so I don't know if you're old like me and and are thinking of retirement. But let's say, for sake of argument, you were retired and you wanted some income, you know, to live on. There is a fund 
uh, and I will be honest, I, I, you know, I, I kind of like this, but I'm not telling you to buy it, but it's called ZWU. And what it is, is it's a Canadian utilities group, actually Canadian and American utilities. So it includes your Telluses and your Rogers, but it also includes utilities like pipelines. Um, I think they've got uh, Enbridge, for example. And what that fund has is a thing called a covered call. And so what it means is that they issue calls, which is an option for somebody to buy the stock. And so if it goes up too much, people can exercise the call. So it limits your upside, but if the stock doesn't go up, you get to keep the money. So you're paying, they're, they're issuing this to, to get a bump. And so it's got a dividend yield of, of north of 6%. And it pays very regularly. Um, it gets, it, it gets increased every once in a while. And if you were older, like me, uh, or, or older and retired, I'm not retired yet, um, and you were looking for a good source of income, by the way, personally, I'm really conservative. So my advice, if I do throw out some examples, they tend to be really conservative. Um, so you know that's my bias. You need to know that. Um, and even though I'm not giving a lot of advice, but those are some things that you could look at. So what's your objective? Remember, we've got to have a goal when we're investing or we're saving money. Is it to get your, your emergency money put away? Might want to use your savings account. You might want to take that money and put it into a tax-free savings account. See, here's the beauty. If you let that grow and grow and grow when you get into retirement, it's not unusual um, if you've been contributing right from the beginning to have a tax-free savings account by the time you retire of uh, in excess of say um, $200,000. That's, that's if you've been contributing since they started it, if you're my age. Now, if you're your age, then picture that in the future when you're my age, which is full, full disclosure, um, I'm 64. And I plan to retire soon. That money, when it comes out of your TFSA, is tax free. So if you had two hundred thousand dollars and you were getting six percent from from uh, ZWU, you could just keep taking that money out. And if you had other funds, you could keep replacing it. That money would come out tax free every year. And what's what's important about that for people in retirement got a little bit higher, a little bit higher income is your old age security gets clawed back and the clawback, which is 15% of the additional dollar begins at, I believe it's 70, 72 or $77,000 a year. Second, I hate not knowing. Hang on. $75,910. And if you made $122,843, you would get no OAS at all. But if you're taking some of the money out of your RS or your TFSA, that doesn't count against that cap. And that's another one of the advantages of a tax-free savings account. And we talked about that last week. So you can invest in TFSAs for growth. Same as mutual funds, and you can invest in TFSAs and mutual funds for income. But I've never, and, and I could be wrong because I really stopped looking at mutual funds several years ago. Um, I really believe TFSAs, and and the markets kind of proved me out because people are shifting in Canada way more towards the exchange traded funds. Um, you can get them that pay a dividend or or pay you every single month, or you can get them that are designed to grow and they'll grow and grow and grow and grow. And grow. But whichever, it's, it's, it's great for the lazy investor because you're not picking individual stocks. So here's the financial information the one I just showed you is it has an MER of 0.09, a management fee of 0.05, and it pays a, a yield. This is how much it would pay you out of 2.74%. Because it's, it's uh, just paying you dividends. It's not got that covered call overlay. So now I'm going to do a quick checkpoint. Are there any questions on mutual funds or exchange traded funds or stocks? And please nothing. feel free to send them to me privately if you if you don't want to send them to everybody. That's allowed. 
But if it's a general question, it's lovely if you can share because as, totally. as, as my grade eight IE teacher once said, don't ever be afraid to ask a question because remember 80% of the class doesn't know the answer either. What do I think about ARC in, is that a company or is that a, an investment in a thing? Because I've never heard of it. I don't, I don't know it. Adam, you're welcome to unmute yourself okay. if you want and, to. And what is meant by yield? So what yield means, that's a great question. Um, yield is if you own a stock that pays a dividend, that's the percent, it's like, it's kind of like the, the interest rate. So the dividend yield is if you've got a hundred shares in say the uh, uh, Toronto, uh, no, CIBC, you're going to get $4. You're going to, because right now CIBC has a 4% dividend return, which is very good when you consider CIBC won't give you that in your savings account. And remember a dividend yield is tax preferred because ta some tax has already been paid on it by the corporation. And so you'll pay lower income tax. If you look back at your notes that I sent out last time, you've got a tax table, which will show the tax rate on qualifying dividends. So that dividend from a, a, a major company, which would be anything trading on a stock exchange would be a qualifying dividend. Ah, okay. What would I recommend when it comes to asset allocation between the TFSA and the RSP Canadian versus US? Where are you getting the best advantage? Great question. Later on, I'm gonna show you the implications of um, a currency exchange. So I'm gonna break that question into a couple of pieces. Piece number one, you can buy two types of exchange traded funds. You can buy hedged, or you can buy unhedged. If it's unhedged, you're taking the full risk of the change in the Canadian dollar. So if the Canadian dollar goes up, the value of your US account goes down and vice versa. If you buy it hedge, what they do is they put in a little thing called a futures contract, which allows them to buy US dollars or, or Canadian dollars at a fixed price in US dollars. That's called hedging. And what it does is it means the growth and the dividends are purely based on how the fund does and it takes away the currency. So hedged means it's hedged to the Canadian dollar. So you're not taking a currency risk. Unhedged means it's in US dollars. Your returns are in US dollars. Your money stays in US dollars. And if the dollar goes up and down, you've got the risk of the stock or the ETF going up and down. And you've got the risk of the currency exchange as well. I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. Now, when it comes to RSPs, the US and Canadian governments recognize one another's savings vehicles for retirement. So in the US, if you've got a 401k and you get a dividend from Canada, it's tax-free. If you have, say, Microsoft in your uh, RRSP, it pays a little, tiny dividend, but that dividend is tax-free. So the IRS doesn't take it. That is not the case in a tax-free savings account. So in your tax-free savings account, if you make a dividend return, this doesn't apply to capital gains, only dividends. If you get a dividend return in, uh, from a US company, the IRS takes 15% of that. Now, if that's Inside your TFSA, you do not get any tax relief from the government of Canada because you don't pay tax on that money. If it's outside of your TFSA or in your RRSP, if it's in your RRSP, it just stays in your RRSP. If it's outside of a registered account, that money that you've paid to the IRS becomes a credit on your Canadian taxes. So there is a disadvantage to dividend producing stocks in a TFSA because you pay the U.S. tax and you do not get the Canadian tax credit. It's a pure tax thing. Okay. Sorry for the convoluted answer, but the question was actually just a wee bit more complex than you may have thought. Okay. I'm just checking my clock. I'm going to move on because I've got some fun stuff to come up with. Real estate. Everybody loves real 
estate. Folks, let me tell you, you can make a lot of money in real estate, mainly because most real estate investments are levered. You, you borrow money, you, you mortgage the house. And banks love to lend money on real estate. In fact, Canadian chartered banks are great big mortgage companies in many ways. That's their biggest single loan group is mortgage. Um, I, I don't know if I, I can't, I can never remember which group I tell which stories to, um, but I, uh, I, I talked to a friend of mine at uh, Bank of Montreal and I said, if I was to buy an investment property, how much can I borrow? He said, put 30% down. We will finance at first mortgage rate, 70%. I said, oh, that's kind of neat. I said, um, what if I wanted to do the same thing and buy Bank of Montreal stock? He said, 50%. I said, so you have more faith in the real estate market than you have in your own bank. And he looked at me and he, he was gobsmacked. He didn't, he never thought of it that way before. Now, there's several different ways that you can invest in real estate. There's the buy and flip for all of you fans of HGTV. There is to buy and develop. So you buy a piece of property and you develop it, you build a house or a shopping center. And to be very honest with you, though that has investment aspects to it, I consider that to be a business. And in fact, many people that buy and flip, people that are adding real value and not counting on the market going up, that's more of a business than it is really an investment because you're putting some work into it. Um, and then there's the idea of buying to rent and hold. And in some cases, um, you buy and you don't do anything. You just buy and hold. Um, now, that can prove problematic and they've started to take um, steps for people that don't rent their places in certain parts of British Columbia. And they charge an empty homes tax on that. And I believe those areas are uh, Metro Vancouver, the Fraser Valley, Metro Victoria, and I think the Kelowna area as well. I think the Kelowna area is included in that as well. So if you own uh, a property and you are not renting that property out or living in it full time, you pay an additional property tax on that property. Uh, but you can also buy and hold raw land. It, it pays no return. So Here's an example. We're going to buy a $300,000 place. And for those of you who think that's chump change, you can make it $3 million. It illustrates the point the same. Um, with closing in taxes, $15,000. So the total cost of the assets, uh, $315,000. We put um, a $94,000 down payment down. We borrow uh, $220,000. Interest rates, 3%. Here's what would happen. Let's say we get $18,000 a year. We have expenses, including interest. And by the way, I made this a Whistler example, so I threw in tourism Whistler fees because I could. When you make the loan payment, only the interest is deductible. The reduction in principal is not. So in this example, though they collected $18,000, they could only expense, or sorry, they rented for $18,000, of the negative cash flow, so that was about twelve thousand six hundred and fifty-two dollars. Yeah, twelve thousand six hundred fifty-two dollars. Um, that ca negative cash flow of four thousand dollars is because you had to pay some interest, but you'd have to pay eight hundred and thirty-six dollars because you would be taxed on the net profit. But even though you made a payment, you can't deduct the principal part. And here's the thing with really low interest rates, it doesn't take very long. It, it can take less than a year before your payment is 50-50 between interest and principal, only the interest. Now, keep in mind, you're paying that down. That's going right into your net worth. Even if the property didn't go up in value, your debt is being reduced. But it's not unusual to have a situation where you have a positive profit and negative cash flow. If that's the case, you're doling money out in order to cover that. Uh, it would be in this example, what, um, 300 and, $383 a month? Something like that. Anyway, you, you 4,000 divided by 12 to, no, 775 a month. Four or 12, 
666 a month would be your negative six six so yeah uh, yeah would be your negative six 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 a month would be your negative cash flow that's coming out of your pocket every month uh, enough to cover your taxes but your your annual income tax because you just increased your 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 marginal tax rate so the the one of the problems with real estate is sometimes it's hard to get to neutral cash flow because of the principal repayment and because you can sometimes make a profit even though you have negative cash flow. That was a really bad explanation. Now, let's say over the course of the years, um, you invested $114,000 because of all the negative cash flow. Your annual increase is 4%. So the value of the property goes up to just under 365,000. It's not unusual over five years to make a $51,000 profit after you sell the place, which isn't a half bad profit, keeping in mind that that's taxed as a capital gain, not taxed as regular income. So you'd only pay income tax on $25,000 of that. And that would be, even if that took you into the top tax bracket, that would be a tax liability of, I always use a down and dirty number of about a quarter. So you're gonna pay about $12,500 in tax. If you're a couple, that further gets split and that means you're not going to go jumping up into a higher tax bracket. And I know one time we, um, I, I'd done this before, uh, I was married at the time and what we did there was we took the capital gain and I took half the value of the capital gain and we RSP'd it. So it mitigated that tax liability. And then we used the other part uh, for some reinvestments uh, and, so, and a few other things. It's very po possible. The problem is this. As much as it's hard to believe, real estate prices do not go up all the time. In fact, in some cases, they drop. And anybody who's been in Whistler for a long time has seen some real peaks and valleys. Um, up until about, let um, see, we bought in. 12, 13, 14, 15, and even 2015, 2016, real estate prices hadn't really started to go up very rapidly here in Whistler. And in 2016, 17, they just started hockey sticking, stabilized. And then after COVID, things have gone insane. Personally, that's just Bill's personal opinion. I would be really, really worried about investing in real estate in Whistler, and I mean as a pure investment, because I think things are frothy. I really believe that. Um, and I know that a lot of what's driving this asset inflation is low interest rates. But one of the things you should be aware of with a place like Whistler is in the event of a recession, one of the first things people get rid of is recreational property. And back in the 80s, property, it was a dime a dozen. The 80s recession in British Columbia was the worst one I've ever seen. And that includes the dot-com, that includes the 94 recession, and the even, even with COVID, the 80s when interest rates went up to 18% was devastating for the province of British Columbia because we were very lumber dependent at the time and housing dried up. Mortgage rates hit 22%. Nobody was buying houses and certainly no one was building houses, which means nobody needed our lumber. And so it really hurt British Columbia. So when other parts of the country were out or moving into a positive zone um, in the early 80s, like Ontario did really well in, from 84, 85. In British Columbia, it wasn't until Expo 86 that really things started to improve here. Whistler got really hammered in real estate at that time. Be very careful in that type of investing because you've got a huge standard deviation um, with, with what's happening in Whistler, even compared to real estate in other uh, places. Just please be careful if you're thinking about real estate investment. Um, I think real estate investment should be a good investment, even if you were just paying off the mortgage as you went. But that's just my opinion. The other thing about real estate investment, there's always things that come up. Tenant doesn't pay. Um, a tenant moves out. You can't find a tenant right away because you've got to do some work on the place. 
uh, repairs, maintenance, things like that. And, and if you want to do well in real estate, you need to time the market. You, you need to know that if things aren't going well, um, I bought a condominium that went leaky. It's assessed value or appraised value would have, if, you know, if, we, if that's what we sold it for, uh, I would have lost $34,000 on a $134,000 investment. Fortunately, had money. You, you, you really need to be careful. And I, I wouldn't recommend real estate investment to anybody that doesn't have some funds behind them in the event of an emergency. Because in the early days, of course, you haven't built up enough equity to be able to borrow money against that existing real estate. So, and the reason I'm giving you all this caution is right now, it must seem to everybody in the world that everybody should be diving into real estate head first, that you can't lose money in real estate. And though that may be true in the long run, as John Maynard Keynes once said, in the long run, we're all dead. And, and sometimes things happen in the short run. And unlike stocks where you can sell a little bit, with real estate, it's kind of, you know, it's binary. It's either you sell it or you don't sell it. You can't sell little pieces of your condominium as an investment. Whereas you could buy a hundred shares in the Royal Bank and run into trouble and you could sell 10 shares of your Royal Bank. You've got 90 shares left. You can't sell one-tenth of a real estate investment very easily. The other thing with real estate is unlike stocks is they have higher closing costs. In fact, somebody once told me as a real estate investor, if you're not getting something for 15% below market, you're underwater the minute you buy the home because of the fees that you pay to buy and the fees that you would have to pay when you're going to sell. Again, you can do very well. You've got to think very long-term if you're a buy and hold kind of real estate investor. If you're a property flipper, that's a different thing altogether. You really need to know your market. But every once in a while, property flippers aren't really getting their value added because they're wonderful decorators like the people on HGTV. It's because they could have bought the thing, done nothing, and the market went up. So again, um, unless you really know what you're doing, that could be a really problematic way to invest. It's not that you can't make money. Don't get me wrong. Lots of people do. But when they have TV shows, it's amazing how they always make money. And I know in real life, not everybody does. So I just, I don't want people to get the idea that this is a, a guaranteed way. I don't believe anything in life is guaranteed. Um, risks and words, there's good cash flow. Um, banks bend over backwards to lend under, easy to finance and great, great capital gains. And when things go up because you've levered it, because you borrowed against it, it's not like you invest $300,000, it goes up 4%, you make a 4% return because you don't invest at all because you borrowed money and you pay less interest than you're receiving as it goes up. Um, vacancies, bad vacancies and bad tenants. And I've had only a couple, but you know, it can, it can cost you. Um, and in British Columbia, especially, um, bad tenants are, anybody's hard to evict here, whether there's good cause or not good cause. Um, and you've got to hold on if, if property values dip. It can be costly to liquidate. Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, and sometimes uh, the listing drags on and on and on, depending on the realtor, depending on the market, depending on the neighborhood. Uh, so again, be careful with that. You've got to really have patience and um, you've got to be in a situation where you can put money in and not panic if you have a few pitfalls in the real estate market. Any questions on real estate that I can answer? By the way, if you like real estate and you don't wanna get into real estate investment, something similar, really good for income, by the way, is called a real estate investment trust. And again, these tend to be investments that are a little bit more common um, with uh, older, older people who, who, are, who want monthly income. So you're not getting it for capital gains, you're getting it for the monthly income. And there's some really, there's some really good real estate investment trusts. Um, if, you, if anybody wants want to take a look at one that, that I think I'm a big fan of is Northwest Health and they um, own the property and rent out the property for nursing homes. So they own the property and a company runs the nursing. They don't run the nursing homes. They effectively are owning the property and leasing 
those um, those um, um, things. Uh, it's called Northwest Health. So you can check any of these stocks. Um, you can go on to any website or if you have a um, a brokerage account. And by the way, if you want a brokerage account, you don't want to invest money. If you want to see if you're any good at this, most brokerage accounts allow you to for free to open a brokerage account and run a dummy account. You can play. You can see if you're any good at this. And, and you can put up a, a model portfolio and see if you can't pick stocks or ETFs. And you can tell how you would have done at the beginning and how you would have done within a year. Test yourself. See, see if you can do it. It doesn't cost you anything to set up a dummy account. And it'll give you a sense of what this looks like. So any questions on real estate that, that I can answer? I've got 10 minutes. I'll cover the rest of this stuff, no problem. Is anybody alive? Are you all Bill, hiding did you see? Did you see that question from Andrea? If oh. you didn't have any RRSP room available uh -huh. to shield capital gains taxes after selling a rental, what else could you do? Pay tax. <laughs> we don't have the ability to roll over in Canada. They do in the US. So if you make a capital gain and then you buy another similar asset, apparently you can roll your capital gains over. We haven't got that in Canada. So you pay tax. Or you give it to me and I'll give you a receipt and I'll pay the tax. But then you don't have the money. So I wouldn't advise that as a very good investment uh, decision. But yeah, you're, 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 going, to, you're going to pay the tax. Um, so, sorry. That happened to my mom and she, she got to be in the richest 5% of Canadians for one year. Thanks, Andrea. That's a good question. Okay, so now let me show you something else. And what I'm about to show you is a really good idea and I don't do it. <laughs> and the reason I don't do it is because I'm too conservative for my own good. Uh, as I, I've told people in past groups, um, uh, my, 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 my dad, he loved penny stocks. I, it, you know, it's funny. He was the most sensible man on God's green earth on everything except investing. And I used to tease him that because I was big into, you know, chartered banks. I mean, like I'm a blue chip, no risk, steady eddy kind of guy. Because again, I know the math and the wrong one, compound interest does the heavy lifting for you. Um, and I used to tease him. I said, dad, you know, it's like you've got the 50 year old's portfolio and I've got the 80 year old's portfolio, 75 year old's portfolio. I've always been very conservative. And even though I know of some really good opportunities for levered investments with these low interest rates, I still won't do it. I just am too afraid. By the way, that's the same reason I have a broker managing most of my money. I'm too emotional. I go, oh, it's gonna break. I sell, you know, sell everything. And, and the other thing is, if you're buying stocks, ETFs are a little bit different. It, you, know, you don't have to be as um, good a student, but, but when you're picking individual stocks and, and looking for opportunities, you've got to know the opportunity before it happens. As a buddy of mine says, once it's on Motley Fool, it's too late. But here's what would happen. Supposing um, I, I invest $1,000 and, oh, that's when the lever goes bad, sorry. So I put $1,000 into a stock. It pays a dividend yield of $30 and the stock price goes up by 5%. My net would be a $50 capital gain, a $30 dividend return. So I've made an 8% return on my investment, okay? But let's say for sake of argument that instead of um, investing $1,000, I bought $1,000 worth of stock, I bought 1,000 shares, pretend they're a dollar a share. I bought $1,000 worth of stock, but I put $500 down and I borrowed the other $500 using either my margin account. That's a, so what a margin account is, if you've got a brokerage account, that's the amount of interest you pay if you buy a stock and you don't have any money, you're borrowing the money. And that's limited to a certain percentage of the value of your stocks. So if you're up near that limit, your stocks go down, they sell some of your stock to bring you back to the right balance. Or you could have taken that from, say, a mortgage-backed line of credit if you want to, 
And, and that's where the other $500 came on. But the point is you're paying interest on it. So the same thing happens. $30 in yield, $1,050 the value at the end of the year, but I paid $20 in interest. So my profit was $60, which is a slightly lower profit, but remember, I only invested $500. So my return on investment was 12%. Now I was gonna to try to show you an example where you didn't put any money down, you borrowed everything, but one of the numbers became infinite, your ROI. So let's say I go, I go nuts. I only put $50 into this. I borrow $950. Same thing happens with the stock. 3% yield, that's $30. 5% um, increase in the value, capital gain, that's $80. But I pay $38 in interest because I borrowed a big whack and chunk of the money, all but 50 bucks. My profit's $42, a little bit low, but my return on investment is 84% because I only invested $50 to buy $1,000 worth of stock. And you're thinking, Hey, Bill, this sounds like a smoking idea because the markets always go up, which is kind of true. However, if you're in a state where you have to sell it, you may not be too happy with it. By the way, the last example I showed you, you could never do that in a margined account because I, I, I think you've got to have, um, I think you have to be at no more than 60, 40. So, so if 40% of the value of your total portfolio is the most you can borrow. So even if I were to borrow, I'd keep it under 20%. I, I, I just, but I'm, I'm paranoid. So, you know, I'm always thinking about the next market crash. Now this looks wonderful until the lever swings the other way. So here's the same scenario. You still get the, the yield. That's the nice thing. You still get your dividend but the stock drops. So this is, this is a really blue chip kind of stock to pay a 3% yield. Like this, is, this is what banks pay, except CIBC, which is a wee bit higher. You know, they, they're paying about three, 3.5% right now. So $1,000 goes into the investment, three, $30 uh, comes to me through dividends, but the stock price drops by 5% to $950. So if I sold everything now, I'd have, I have $50 capital loss. I'd have a, three, a $30 capital gain for a profit of minus $20 or a return on investment of minus 2%. And again, if I don't sell the stock, it's only a paper investment because stocks do go up and down and up and down. But if I had to sell the stock, that's what would happen. Let's now do the 50-50 split. We borrow $500. We put $500 of our own money in and invest it. We still get the $30 dividend yield. Our stock still drops by $50, but in addition, we have to pay $20 on our investment. So our profit is negative $40, negative $20 in, from example one, plus the $20 we paid in interest. On my $500 investment, negative $40 is a negative 8% return. By the way, if you're ever in a situation where the yield exceeds the borrowing rate, you're always going to at least be neutral from a cash flow point of view because the interest is being covered by the dividend. So let's say we go the crazy route and you can see what happens there. You put $50 down, you borrowed $950. You got $30 in yield, but you lost $50 in capital gains. If you had to sell out, you'd have lost 58 of your $50. You have a negative 116% yield. And in fact, that investment is now underwater because remember, you have borrowed $950 and the value is only $942. So your investment's underwater. You have negative net worth. You're Donald Trump in the 1980s. And nobody wants to be that. So that's the danger of using um, levered investments. And although I know some fairly high yielding dividend, or especially ETFs, uh, and a friend of mine does this, he finds high yield ETFs and he buys those and let them kind of pay it out. Um, every once in a while, these things drop. Anytime something's got too high a yield, it's the old, if it sounds too good to be true, 
there's probably a catch. There's probably a catch. So if somebody's got too high a dividend, what they're quite often doing is they're giving you some of your own money back as part of the investment. And so that is not a sustainable dividend. Whereas if you buy shares in the Royal Bank, uh, what was I reading about CIBC? Um, they only pay out 68% of their earnings. The rest is retained by the bank to, to allow the bank to grow. And then if they need more capital bases, we talked about last time, they would issue a preferred share. So again, levered investments to me, that's for people, it's almost that that's that part of your portfolio, you can afford to lose money. But if you had to kind of jump start, jump charge it, and you're not afraid of taking the risk, you know, interest rates are pretty low right now. If there was ever a time to do it, maybe it isn't a bad time. I know a lot of people think the markets are going to stay strong. I don't think they're going to keep growing as fast as they have this year. They've grown very quickly this year, but they think they're going to continually go up. And a lot of people believe that the stimulation, especially in the United States, is going to put the economy next year, especially when the money starts to circulate, is, is going to just, um, it, it, the economy in the U.S. is going to be on steroids. It, it's going to be crazy. Uh, now, when you invest in foreign stocks or, and this is something a lot of people don't know, you know, you can invest in Canadian stocks in the U.S. stock market. So if you were to buy shares in, again, I'll use my favorite Royal Bank, because it's the biggest bank in the country. Um, you can do the same thing with other stocks, though, things like TELUS. They're not just listed in the Canadian Stock Exchange, the Toronto Stock Exchange. They're also listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And in the New York Stock Exchange, they trade in U.S. dollars, and the dividends are paid in U.S. dollars. Here's what I don't know. I don't know, because I'm not really a tax expert, so you're going to have to check this with your tax professional. If you have U.S. dollar Canadian stocks, whether you still have to pay 15% to the IRS, I do not know that. But a lot of people will do that, or they'll buy U.S. paying stuff. If, for example, again, I'll use the retirement example, you're a snowbird, you like to spend time in the United States, you'd like to have a source of U.S. money coming in to save you on the exchange rate. So that U.S. money comes in, builds up, you put it into your U.S. account, and you take it out when you're going to go to Phoenix or Palm Springs or Las Vegas. I don't know where you people like to go. Anywhere you want. Right now, you can't go anywhere. So you've got two ways of losing and gaining money. You can lose, it, or three ways, really, I suppose. The stock goes up and down. You get paid the dividend, or the currency goes up and down. And as I said earlier, some mutual funds and a lot of exchange traded funds use a hedge against currency risk. Most of the time, when you're investing even in other countries, you are probably, unless you're buying directly into European uh, or um, Japanese exchanges, you're going to be buying things in US dollars, even if it is um, on the, on the um, Japanese exchange or if it's on the FTSE, uh, which is the uh, FTSE is uh, just a nickname for the, um, the uh, British Stock Exchange. Um, they've all got funny names. Uh, Frankfurt Exchange is in Germany. Uh, anyway, uh, but there, if you're going to invest in, in, in foreign stocks, as a general rule, if it isn't in Canada or the US, I would, even if it's in Europe, I would generally lean towards an exchange traded fund. But if you're really into doing it, you can invest in pounds or euros or anything you want. Just understand you're taking a double risk uh, when you're doing that. Any questions before I get into beer and barley? Of course, it's past eight o'clock. Now your brains are probably turned to mush. I know mine is. So here's commodity investing in a nutshell. And what was that? Is it GameStop? So they were using futures, but they were stock futures, not agricultural. I'm going to show you the example of agricultural futures. And they were buying options because 
they were tired of short sellers. Now, what short selling is, is when you sell a stock before you buy it with hopes that it will go down. That's what a short sell is. And there are people that exclusively are short sellers. That's all they do. I, I uh, the, the problem with short selling is because the stock can go up you know, um, on an unlimited basis, your potential for loss is unlimited. So what would happen is, is Jeanette's got a hundred shares at a dollar a share. I say, Jeanette, I want to borrow 50 of your shares and I sell them and I get $50. Jeanette's going to want those back because I've borrowed them from her. My hope is that those stocks drop. I can buy them back for less than I paid for them. I give Jeanette her stocks back and I keep the difference. Stock goes up, I'm not in such great shape. That's what um, um, buying a, um, a future is. An option is a similar thing, but you don't have the, uh, you're not required to buy it, but you have the ability to buy that. So what the, the people on the trading boards did was they bought options, which drove up the value of this game stock, which put the short sellers in trouble because the stock price went up because all these people were putting money into the options, which is a lot cheaper than buying the stock. And they eventually have to cover their, their, their shorts. It's called a short squeeze, by the way, if you're interested. They had a really good explanation of it. I think it was on the indicator on NPR uh, of, of what this was. So if, and, and people have been asking, you know, how does this happen? And, uh, you know, with these boards, it's amazing how our herd can get stampeding very, very quickly. In the long run, these things dissipate. But in the short term, you can really be hurt. So although I understand short selling, it's like leverage. Um, I'm, I'm too risk averse, but that doesn't mean you should be, especially those of you who are younger, you, you've got time to recover from any mistakes that you make. But again, I'm a slow and steady dollar cost averaging, boring kind of guy, which really isn't the kind of thing you, know, you should ever put on a dating site. But, but that's another story altogether. I know you're all blowing, you're laughing like crazy. Huh? Okay, thank you very much. Like I say, not nearly as much fun if it's not for a live studio audience. So here's the deal. Billy has a brewery. Billy brews beer. Brian has a barley farm. Brian grows barley. So the reason futures exist is because as the beer producer, I want to know how much I'm going to be paying for barley. Thank you. I want to know how much you're going to, I'm going to pay for barley. I want certainty in my costing as part of my business plan. But commodity prices tend to go up and down quite a bit, but I want some certainty. So I make a deal with the barley farmer saying, I will give you X dollars per bushel. Now, Brian, because he knows what his yields are, by the way, yield in farming is different than yield in the stock market. Yield would be how many bushels per acre he gets. So he knows how many bushels per acre he's probably going to get. And if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, um, he has, he has um, in, uh, crop insurance for that. But he, he's pretty sure he knows how many bushels per acre he's going to get. What he doesn't know is what the price will be when he harvests it. So he and I do a deal. He's pre-sold his barley crop to me for a fixed price. And I pre-know what my cost of barley is going to be during the barley harvest. I'm going to buy enough barley for beer. And I now know my beer prices. So what we've just engaged in is a futures contract. And the reason it's a contract is because I'm going to get the barley. I'm like, I'm going to like a whole whack of barley is coming my way. But that's good because I use barley. I'm not trying to make money buying and selling barley futures, I use barley. So this is very common for, for companies um, or individuals, but mostly for companies that want certainty on certain commodities in the future. So um, beer producers will buy barley futures, and maybe there's hops futures too, I'm not 100% sure. Airlines do this, they will buy futures for their jet fuel. So they know what their jet fuel costs are so that they can sell tickets and know what their costs are going to be and not worry as much about the price of oil and the price of jet fuel. So that's very, very common in the airline industry. Other people um, do the same thing, but instead of a, an agricultural commodity, 
they'll use the currency markets. So if you know, let's say I'm a Canadian company, but a lot of my revenue is in, Can in US dollars, I may use a hedging strategy by the same token. Maybe I'm a Canadian manufacturer, but I buy inputs from the United States in US dollars. I want some certainty. And so you can buy these contracts. Alternatively, oh right, contract to buy is a call, a contract to sell is a put. Options give somebody the right to buy, but not the obligation. And by the way, I checked barley contracts and a barley contract is for 20 million metric tons. So you can't just buy that if you're an investor here in Whistler or somebody's going to come with the truck and you are going to take possession of 20 million metric tons. I have no idea how much volume is in 20 million metric tons of barley. And I personally choose not to find out because I live in a very small apartment. Um, what's happened is the futures market has become a market unto itself. And one of the films that I would strongly recommend to you, and I've spoken of it before, I'm sure, is a movie called The Big Short. And it is the story of the U.S. Um, financial crisis. And it was getting so ridiculous. And they have the most beautiful scene in that film explaining futures on futures on futures on futures on futures. So it's not just Bill and Brian buying and selling barley contracts. It's somebody buying a barley option and somebody buying an option on the option and an option on the option on the option. And there's this beautiful scene in a casino with Selena Gomez, who apparently is an actress and an economist called Richard Thaler. I had to ask my kids who the young lady was who was with the economist Richard Thaler. Um, and he explains the futures market using blackjack. So you've got the two guys and you've got the fellow and he's betting against, he's bet playing with the dealer. And a guy standing behind him says, I'll bet you a hundred dollars that the house wins. And he says, yeah, I'll take a hundred for 105. No problem. The guys behind them says, hey, I'll bet you a thousand dollars that guy wins his bet. Okay, I'll take that. The guy behind him says, hey, I'll bet you $10,000 that that guy wins his bet. So all of a sudden this, this, you know, $50 bet becomes a $100 bet, becomes a $1,000 bet, becomes a $10,000 bet. And they describe it beautifully in the film, The Big Short. Um, it's, it's a really cool film because they have these little outtakes explaining what's happening behind it. And if you, it's also, I mean, Stephen Carell is wonderful in that film. Um, he, like he, we all know him from the office and doing kind of crazy things, but he's, he's, he's really good. Uh, Brad Pitt was tremendous in that film too. Um, it, it might might be worth watching. It it kind of enlightens you. Um, but the funny thing is, is that futures have a real positive value in our economic system. So uh, you know, though I would regular, I, I would never want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because it can be a win win situation. The farmer knows how much money he's got. Now he can take that to the bank because now there's not any doubt about how much he's going to get paid for his commodity. And the beer producer knows what his beer costs or her beer costs are going to be for the next little while. So it can be a win-win situation. Um, there are agricultural commodities, livestock commodities, the famous, hey, what's the Flintstones? It was always the big cartoon business broker was always buying and selling pork bellies. Um, there are energy futures markets. There's an electricity futures market. Um, for an exchange, you can get stock and bond. Um, usually they're done through options. And there are interest rates. They're called interest rate swaps. And you're effectively betting on the direction of interest rates. And again, you know, if you've got a lot of money outstanding and, and you're worried about interest rates going up, it, it's quite legitimate for you to want to protect yourself using a futures contract. But now they just become bets in the open market, they have nothing to do with the insurance component or the assurity component that they were originally intended for. And apparently the first ones were in the 1600s or the 16th century, I can't remember which, in Japan for rice. It could come up on Jeopardy someday. 
that is all I have on investing. I have a few final words um, and I'll give you those and then ask for questions. So Shakespeare once said, and I think I started this with a Shakespearean quote on lending. I will finish that this to thine own self be true. Um, you know, folks, government can do so much for us, but when it comes to our long-term financial future, government can't do everything. Uh, um, maybe they will someday, but right now uh, they won't. Your Canada pension is only designed to, uh, for you who are young uh, with the new changes and the increases in costs that have been incurred, is only actually designed to replace about a third of your income. Your uh, old age pension might replace a bit. It's a fixed amount. I think right now it is $627 a month or something like that. Uh, and that, that, as I said, can get clawed back at a certain level. Um, but, but most people only get 60% of the maximum Canada pension. So that won't be enough going into retirement. So whether you're building wealth for retirement or whether you're building wealth, as I say, to you know, leave a legacy to your cat, um, you've got to be true to yourself. And, 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 and you, know, you have to be a little individualistic and take care of yourself. And sometimes that means some sacrifice in the early days for some benefit down the road. Um, control your spending, develop your budget, determine where you are today and develop some debt reduction goals. Start by saving a little bit every month and try to be disciplined. I was gonna say thank you for the test. So this was the first set of slides as I say, I, I must have the other, I think they're on my other computer and they didn't get uploaded to the cloud. Um, that's kind of all I've got. I'm gonna stop sharing and turn this off. Are there any questions on anything we've covered? Um, anything at all? Uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself or type it in. Um, I said I'd be done before 8.30. I, I lectured a little longer than I wanted to, but any questions at all? You do have my contact information. Don't hesitate to send me an email. I have a couple of questions here, Bill. Okay. Um, first off, any book recommendations for investing specifically? Uh, again, I'm a big fan of The Wealthy Barber, but that's probably more along the lines of regular savings. Um, I really like that book. Um, other than that, I more am a media person. Like my favorite guy in, in ETFs and large cap stocks is a fellow named Larry Berman. Um, he has a show on BNN called Berman's Call. Uh, and, and I just think he makes a great deal of sense in a lot of the things that he talks about. Um, keep in mind, when reading any book or listening to anybody, me included, we all have our own biases. Um, I know a fellow um, here in Whistler, he is a very astute invest investor and he does nothing but small cap investments, but he's got a pretty healthy bank account behind him. So he's willing to take those higher risks. And in the long run, he does get higher rewards. So I'm sure that if you talk to him, he'd talk to you about small caps so or smaller companies that, that you can buy stocks in. I bias towards the tried and true. That's just who I am. Um, you won't see me putting money into Bitcoin or into Ethereum, but I know people have made money at it. I'm not a fan. I um, And what's the new one? These new non-fungible assets? You, 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 there, it, it's, you, can, you can buy a digital painting, but you don't own it. You don't own the copyright, but you kind of supported the artist. And, and, and some of these are going up like mad in value, but, but don't judge anything on what's happening right now. We are in a really weird and unusual time. And to think that this is going to remain forever, I think is a, is a fool's errand. Um, uh, enjoy the ride, but you know, remember what happened after the last roaring twenties, we had the dirty thirties. And there are many people that are looking at COVID and looking at what happened in the Spanish flu, which wasn't really Spanish, about a hundred years ago, that led to the Roaring Twenties. And a lot of people are making some analogies on that. 
uh, that that post COVID people are going to take the attitude, um, you know, um, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we should may die. Um, I'm I'm just hoping to get a full ski season in next year. Fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> Bill, how about um, this? Is another question. How much would you say is needed? for retirement within the context <laughs> that you were oh, I get that a lot. Um, I, there, there's a company called Fisher, oh, F Fisher Management, they're out of Victoria. I made the mistake of clicking on something and ordering their guide. They're convinced that you can do it on half a million. Uh, it depends on what your retirement goals are. A friend of mine is absolutely convinced that the best way to retire cheap is to reduce your costs because you have to pay your costs with after-tax dollars. So his goal in life is, is, is to become BC Hydro neutral or negative. So BC Hydro would end up owning him money. So he's got, um, he, he, he obsessively compulsively checks his power consumption every day. Um, and what he's learned is which appliances take the most stuff. And he says, the guy on the BC Hydro commercials is right. Using your deep, or not deep fryer, um, air fryer and your um, toaster oven is cheaper than your real oven, but I digress. Um, it also depends on what kind of lifestyle you've got. And do you have debt? Will you have debt going into retirement? I'm still a big fan of the 4% rule, but between you, me and the lamppost with the right combination of exchange traded funds that have covered calls attached to them, I think you can you could probably generate more than that fairly easily. Um, I, I have no trouble getting um, six percent on stuff that is not going to move a great deal. Like I say, really solid, solid ETFs. And then there's a couple of real estate investment trusts. They tend to be a little bit more volatile. But remember, if, if if you don't care about it going up and down, you just care what money you're getting every month. It's it's a little bit like buying a, um, an annuity, especially with interest rates being so very low. By the way, I don't buy into the age minus 100 should be the amount in, in bonds. It's something like that or the amount in stock. I don't believe that anymore because bond returns are just so anemically low. And when interest rates going to go up, going to go tax down. Any tax minimization strategies when it comes to drawing down your portfolio in retirement? Great question. You want to make sure you're using a combination of dividends and capital gains. If it's all dividends, it could affect your OAS because of the, what's called the gross up. That's a, I'm not a tax expert. I, I know my way around it, but I'm not a tax expert. Um, but, but here's the problem. When it's in your RRSP and it becomes a RIF, there are no tax minimization strategies. So you get no advantage of dividends, no advantage of capital gains. It doesn't matter how the income is generated within your RSP. When it comes out, you pay tax on it. And, and very high net worth individuals need to be careful about RSPs unless they're so high worth, they're not worried about losing all of their, their benefits because you can inadvertently put yourself into a higher tax rate in retirement. Um, this is especially true for the self-employed, where we can play a few other um, a, a few other games. But try to keep that balance as you're drawing down between your dividends and your capital gains. Keep your interest-bearing stuff in your RSP because the interest-bearing stuff outside of the RSP is at your full tax rate. But you want your unregistered stuff to be a combination of dividends and capital gains. So look at your whole portfolio, including your RSPs, when you're balancing your fixed income, which pays interest versus your dividend and capital gain stuff. Um, you really wanna see a good financial advisor on things like that and a good accountant um, because, and, and it's not a bad idea to see a, um, a fee for service advisor because that takes some of the bias away, okay? And, and sometimes you just end up kicking the can down the end of the road. I find that no matter what I end up doing, whatever math I do, I'm going to have to have one big ass tax year as I transition into retirement. But that's the funny thing is, is I'm supposed to be getting that advice from my broker fairly soon because they've got an accountant on staff. 
No, I don't. And I wouldn't give an, a recommendation on that area. I don't want to get into trouble. I really don't. I don't even know if we have any fee-for-service people up here. No, just keep in mind, if they're not fee-for-service, they make money by selling you stuff. I'm sorry to sound skeptical, but one of the reasons I feel comfortable doing this is I can't sell you anything. I only charge businesses for financial advice. That's, that's my real life job. I don't charge people for this because I, I, my biases are, I, I want you to feel that, that I'm trying to give people the best possible information. Um, but you can also, you've got some good local accountants um, who can certainly help you on the tax minimization part of that. And, and especially the, the accounts that do a lot of personal tax, personal investment tax returns. And there are some here in, in the Sea to Sky Corridor. Um, I, I think BDO has an office at, uh, at Creekside. That's a fairly well-respected national accounting firm. Not that independent accounting firms are bad. I know a couple of really good accountants that are in independent accounting firms as well. Sometimes it's better to start with your accountant. If you have one. Anybody else? Of course, as Bill said, you're welcome to email him, Bill Erickson mm -hmm. at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. With a CH. Very important. And it sounds like Bill and I are going to cook up a little survey to send to you folks um, asking about timing, topics, etc. So you can stay tuned for that in your inbox sometime soon. Yeah, but you'll do your normal survey just mm -hmm. normally as a separate thing, right? Yeah, so that'll we're, be separate. But we're on board with that. I don't yeah. want to step on anybody's toes. <laughs> no, of course not. You know me, I'm the king of I don't want to offend anybody. Sometimes I feel so Canadian. It just I, I just want to wear a plaid shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we do love that about you, Bill. <laughs> but but the funny thing is is I'm not the only one. I mean I sometimes see you know it's so funny with COVID. We're so in a uh, don't want to get too close to people. We're all backing off and apologizing like mad. I'm thinking I'm only in Canada. <laughs> We've been training for this our whole lives. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. There's a few times. I, I'd like to think we're trying to cut some people some slack during these times. Uh, but, you know, I know we're all getting frustrated. I know I am. Mm -hmm. But we got to keep it inside. Got to mm -hmm. still stay polite. -y. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let y'all go because I've got 8:28. Normally I'd go down to the pub, but I'm not gonna sit outside even under a fire tonight. Uh, but again, any questions, let me know. We're going to put something together. And, and I think what I put together, I'm going to be a uh, hopeful, Jeanette. It'll be as if we're, we're together at the library. I, I, I'm convinced yeah. that by next year, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we'll be there. And, you know, if anybody wants me to wear a mask, I'll just wear a mask for its own sake. You know, like just if you want, you know, <laughs> don't put a mask on. Don't want to look at you. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll put up myself on mute, I, I guess. <laughs> Anyway, folks, have a nice evening. Uh, Thanks, everybody. And again, thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you've learned something. And I hope you've had a little bit of fun. Take care. We always do. Um, okay. And thank you, Bill. Um, and everybody, everybody else, have a great night. And you'll hear from us soon with a few survey bits and pieces. Take, take care. All right. Talk Thanks, Bill. Later. Bye now. Bye, everybody. Bye.